as we begin, I want to express my appreciation certainly to the congregation here uh, for being asked actually to be a part of this lectureship. I was acquainted, first of all, with the work here back in 2002 when I began preaching at the Bay Manette congregation and had opportunities to come down in this lower part of uh, Alabama and Florida and the area here to spend a little time. I stayed there a few years, but then I kind of lost contact when I moved back to Mississippi and began working at Magnolia Bible College. And so it's really good to get to come back down this way and get reacquainted, some I hadn't seen in quite a few years, and to make some new friends as well. And I'm so thankful for this opportunity to get to be here. Um, I first got to know Brother Guyton's family back uh, with the first congregation I was serving at back in the 1990s. And uh, he has family in that area there in Lamar County, Alabama. And uh, I really, truly grew to love and appreciate his grandparents, uh, the times that they would pop in for visits and hold meetings for us, various things, and times of both of them, great encouragers for me. So I know he has a rich family heritage, and I uh, appreciate the work that he does here. And again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be with you. <clears throat> now, when I was first asked about coming to be a part of the lectureship, didn't have a clue what uh, any topics, assignments, theme, anything would be. Certainly, you know, I was excited about that and, and loved the opportunity to do so. I don't know about the other speakers, but uh, for me, it was automatically, my mind is gravitating toward, well, I, I don't know what assignment I may get, but I kind of hope deep down that I get an assignment that would not be the, the usual, you know, something that would be a little different, something that would challenge me a little bit, something that's not already been exhausted, and you've got rows and rows of books on your shelves, files that thick about, and so be careful what you ask for, okay? <laughs> Lesson number one. I was told I'll have the Nestorian and Oriental Orthodox churches. Uh, Brother Eskew mentioned uh, on martyrdom about calling up some of his brethren and asking, you know, how many of you have, have sermons filed away on this? And he said he, he didn't have any that he ran to. Well, guess what? I checked around as well. And let me see if we, counting all of them that responded, I guess we'd have to say about zero on Nestorianism and Oriental Orthodox churches. So uh, it has been a learning experience for me, no doubt. I hope that you'll get something out of it as well. But I did find out by my observation in trying to find uh, the research and everything together to put into this, all I really would have had to have done was made one call. Brother Warren, <laughs> after our previous lesson and as thorough as he is and with the, uh, uh, the knowledge and background and him being a student himself, uh, I appreciate he and Brother Montgomery as well and the lessons that they have carried on already today because this kind of dovetails into where we're headed now. And I also feel though before we get into the material, there's one more thing I need to say and, and thank you so much for the meals that have been provided. Uh, it's been wonderful and and I also know, though, coming back in and getting seated and getting comfortable after a big meal is a very dangerous thing. So I'm going to go ahead and share something with you up front. Just something for you to think about, okay? Heard a story of a young preacher who hadn't been preaching very long in this little small country congregation. One Sunday, they were having their potluck lunch. They had lunch and decided to come right back in for an early afternoon service. And so they came in there in the auditorium, got seated. And about midway through his sermon... This preacher noticed about halfway back on his left, there was a little boy who literally stood up in the pew. He, I say little boy, he may have been around four or five years old. Stood up, turned around, and he threw a chestnut at one of the members toward the back. I mean, he just literally let it fly. Well, the preacher was sort of taken back, of course, about that. He tried to regain his, his composure, and he continued on with his lesson. About five minutes later, same thing, the little boy stood up again. This time it was someone over on this side, but he let another one fly. And so the preacher's looking around, and, and nobody else seems to be noticing what's going on. So he goes on again, and finally for a third time, the little boy stands up, and he lets another chestnut loose. And this time, he's just really shocked, the preacher is about this, and he just loses all train of thought, and, and he's just there, just silent. Well, the little boy notices the preacher's quit talking, notices the silence, and so without missing a beat, he just looks over his shoulder, he holds up another chestnut, he says, you go right ahead with your preaching, mister, I'll keep them awake. <laughs> All right, now I said that to say this. I have volunteers strategically placed among you 
ample supply of chestnuts. Don't test them, okay? <laughs> All right, stay with me. We're going to combine these two, uh, and as I said, we're going to see what happens when you start having departures from God's Word, when that being our sole authority, when you start getting away from that as these councils and things we've already studied today, you're going to see where things can develop and where they go. As far as way of introduction and overview of the Nestorian church, if you decide you want to get up and ride up and down the highways and you're going to look for a big sign out front somewhere that says the Nestorian church, well, you're going to have a tough time doing so because really it's, it's not a, as we would think, maybe a the Lutheran, Methodist, and Baptist, and on we go to see a sign up. It's more of a belief system. It's, it's, it's on certain doctrines that are attributed to a man named Nestorius. It's not so much a proper name given to a specific denomination. And uh, you can do a search, which I began trying to find out about Nestorian church, and you're going to find there are several denominations that, that identify themselves uh, completely or in part at least to this doctrine of Nestorius. And I mentioned a website here in the material that you have called Nestorian.org. And when you go, and I thought about trying to go as close as I can to the sources to get from them. And so under the history tab that they have there, it says you will have the Church of the East, the Persian Church, East Syrian Church, Chaldean Syrian Church, Holy Apostolic Catholic Church of the East, and the Assyrian Church of the East. And so... Uh, along with the claims of these various groups of claiming to trace their origin all the way back to the first century. But they say early on they were not known by these different names. They were just simply known as the Church of the East, or you'll read the Persian Church in some materials. Finally, at about the uh, fifth century, the Persian Church began to be won over to Nestorianism and then began to be termed by that term Nestorian. There are various religious groups, though, that... Um, uh, hold to various doctrines here, but for our, our material and information, let's think mostly about what's called the Church of the East. As I said, one time called that Persian Church, because that's where most of the information I could find would come from. As far as a little history, let's go back to this man called Nestorius. I know he had already been mentioned previously, and uh, he was originally a Catholic monk, became presbyter at Antioch, and finally was elevated to the archbishop, as we would say, as uh, this patriarch Constantinople in 428. Now during his time, there were two major schools of thought there in the East. There was the Antiochian group and then the Alexandrian group. Those in Antioch spoke of the two natures of Christ. They became known in some of the terms that Brother Warren has already shared with us, Diophysites, and that means the idea of having the two natures. And then there was, as far as the Alexandrians, the one nature, Monophysites. So Nestorius was a former disciple of one named Theodore. Now, he was a student in school in Antioch, so keep in mind there the two natures. And Theodore really held very strongly to this idea of Christ and the divine side and the human side and it being uh, so rigidly separated. He didn't openly, from what I understand, just come out and say it, but definitely the idea is that he just virtually saw him and tried to present this idea of being virtually a, a double person here when we talk about Christ. So Theodore's thinking in the terms of a human Jesus who became God, while his opposition is thinking the reverse of that. There's the divine Christ who became man. So Nestorius began to really be involved in this controversy over a word, Theotokos, uh, God-bearer or literally the mother of God. And, and Nestorius, a lot like his teacher, Theodore, he was very much opposed to that expression, uh, mother of God. That was being applied now, of course, to the Virgin Mary by this time. So Nestorius decides he wants to suggest a, a more of a middle expression, kind of a, he would say as a neutral term, and, and instead of what that Theotokos, he says, let's go with Christotokos. And, and now that means mother of Christ, because therefore saying in his mind, you know, Christ is at the same time he's God and man. So he suggested that, but he just kept rejecting this term Theotokos, and so all those around him started feeling that he's uh, uh, rejecting what has already been set, and now he's constituting Christ of being two persons. So by the time you get to 429, this controversy is really beginning to take off. So there's this disagreement over terminologies, and the Nestorian uh, controversy begins. 
All right, now back from the other school of thought, Alexandrian. There's this very powerful antagonist that came up against Nestorius. The name was Cyril, Cyril of Alexandria. And so in, in, in him listening and, and uh, deciding what Nestorius is saying and what he is meaning, he came to understand that Nestorius is saying that this second person of the Godhead, he, he is a, a man, Jesus, who was born and he suffered and died on the cross, but then there's the divine side, the logos, the eternal and the unbegotten. And so he says Nestorius is confusing the divine and the human natures of Christ. And he's creating problems with that. So there was this conflict. And Cyril and Nestorius uh, started going head to head. But really you can look at it in a couple of different ways. From one point of view, it was a struggle between these two schools of thought those in Antioch and those at Alexandria and their ideas on the Christologies and, and, and the thought of Christ. The church at Antioch is going to give more emphasis to the humanity of Jesus. The church at Alexandria is going to give more emphasis, of course, to the divinity of Jesus. But it wasn't just that. You see, there were also some political things underway here. There was a conflict because of this rivalry that was already taking place between Alexandria and Constantinople. And so now you're going to have the idea of the politics getting into it as well. Now, one of the sources I looked at was uh, Schaff, and according to him, Cyril wrote letters to Nestorius. He wrote letters to the emperor, finally to the Roman bishop, as we, uh, the Pope uh, Celestine. And so he's warning, Cyril is, all of these bishops and churches, uh, east and west, everywhere around about these dangerous heresies of his rival Nestorius. So Celestine condemned Astorius' doctrine in the Roman Council 430. And so this controversy is getting very publicized and, and it's getting to a critical point. They feel like well, the only way they can really settle this is by having an ecumenical council. Council of Chalcedon in 451 wanted a definition of faith about Christ. The council, of course, decreed that we would say essentially that Diophysite in nature and that alienated then the Monophysite churches, which was the Syrian, the Coptic, Armenian, Ethiopian, Orthodox. Uh, they then separated themselves from the Western church after this council. And so as history continued on about Nestorius himself, it is said that he was uh, dragged from one place of exile to another, Arabia and then to Egypt. And uh, sometime after 49, he died uh, some sources suggest that he died in Egypt at 450, but others say that no one knows exactly when or where he died. Now, some scholars now today, having the information that they have, go back and study this, and, and they believe that Nestorius actually was unjustly accused of some of the doctrines that uh, was said for him to hold. After his exile, he did have a writing, an apology. It survived only in Syriac, and it was under the pseudonym, the Bazaar of Heracles. And in this writing, it is said that Nestorius actually attempts to try to justify his position in answering those criticisms from Cyril. And uh, I didn't have the opportunity to try to really go in and, and really dig deep into that and his responses. But again, a lot of scholars today that have done that feel that he really didn't hold as strongly to each of those uh, beliefs that he was accused of having. But here's, I guess, what I've come to the conclusion, you know, whether deservingly or not, Nestorius actually had heresy attached to his name, and those that held on to similar ideas as his were labeled as Nestorians. And so from there, we can talk a little bit about the expansion of Nestorianism. This Council of Ephesus 431, it condemned Nestorianism, and then we had a division. It wasn't, I guess, intentionally set out to be that way, but that's what happened. Uh, there was an attempt at unity made, though, in 433. A formula of union, a mutual understanding, was signed, but it didn't get very far. Uh, it didn't end the disputes about the natures of Christ and his deity and his humanity. And so several years after the death of Nestorius, the Christians of the Persian Empire heard about this controversy. Uh, this Persian church, the Tur Church of the East, well, they looked at what was being said about Nestorius, and they actually said, well, that's really the way they felt all along. That's the views that they had held. So then, as persecution arose in the followers of Nestorius, many of them began to flee from the Roman Empire, and hearing that over in the east, they were very favorable toward that, so they started gravitating that way. 
And uh, again, Schaff, he points out that by 489, the Storianism had pretty much ended in the Roman Empire. However, things were very different in Persia and over in the east. And so as far as some of the, the history of the spread of Nestorianism, he said it was attributed to, number one, these Persian kings really favored this uh, Antiochian uh, ideology, the Nestorian theology. They also liked the idea of the political opposition to Constantinople. Uh, there was a Council of Seleucia, 498, and, and then they renounced all connection with the Orthodox Church of the Roman Empire. So they began calling themselves the Chaldean or Assyrian Christians, but their opponents just called them Nestorians. The Nestorian church went on and it flourished, from what I understand, for several centuries. It spread from Persia. Uh, they had missionaries that had a great zeal and enthusiasm, so they carried it over to India and to Arabia and even to China. But then by the time you get as late as the 20th century, uh, there's, there's an impact then upon them. They were pushed out of their ancestral lands and, and they were scattered more than ever before. As they were clustering to each other, they were to, uh, fund, found these communities where they can hold together and continue on with their old faith. So we have places then that really saw a stronghold in Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, and Kuwait, and Greece, Italy, Sweden, Russia, and in the U.S., in Canada, and Australia. So as we now think about today, and, and what do we know about Nestorianism today? Well, the Nestorian church is still in existence. As I said, now you may not find it technically with that name, but when you go again to uh, their website, Nestorian.org, you'll, you'll find that their description is that it's a representation of this ancient church of Persia, sometimes referred to as the Assyrian, the or East Syrian church, or the church of the East. And I thought it was interesting that even though with their beginning and, and where they still have strongholds, their headquarters currently is in Chicago. And um, as far as the number of adherents, when you start trying to find out over in the Middle East, at least I couldn't come up with, with any accurate numbers that were offered. But one source said that in the year 2000, when uh, some of the statistics, according to Obama and Winkler anyway, the, the Assyrian of the East said there were 285,000, and of that number, 100,000 were here in the United States. As far as the organization of the Nestorians and what they believe and how they are set up, they have uh, what they say is common with the other Eastern rites. They have this uh, liturgy is said in Aramaic and Syriac, and they say it's probably one of the oldest in existence today. They call it the Assyrian. They have ordained clergy. They have bishops. They have presbyters. They have deacons. They organize themselves into parishes and dioceses and provinces. In 310 A.D., uh, Papa Bargaja, he's a bishop of the capital city of the Persian Empire, he decided to organize the bishops of the church, and he started using the model, of course, of what was used in the West. He had bishops under his jurisdiction, and then he claims this title for himself, Catholicos of the East. Now, the Catholicos became the presiding bishop of the entire church. And so in the 5th century, he receives this title, Patriarch. Now, as far as their doctrinal beliefs regarding the Bible, regarding the Scriptures, the official Bible of the Church of the East is the Peshitta. And it's the simple version. In Aramaic, it means straight. Uh, they had the Old Testament, of course, translated from Hebrew and the Greek New Testament into Syriac around the 2nd century A.D., and I decided in trying to share with you ideas about what it's like in their worship services to go to where as close as I could find, and that's right from a source in San Jose, California. The Assyrian Church of the East in San Jose has listed as this being uh, what you can expect as far as doctrinal beliefs and what they adhere to. It says the Church of the East has a sacramental system. It resembles the sacramental system of the Greek and Latin traditions. There are those sacraments, of course, that regards baptism, the Eucharist being primary. Holy orders is going to affect the other sacraments. They have a confirma confirmation administered uh, with baptism. Absolution, they say the benefit of the Eucharist. Of course, there's the sign of the cross, unction, holy leaven, and these additional sacraments. So you can already see some of the borrowing, the similarities of that which they were accustomed to already. They say the central feature of the worship life there in that church is going to be the Eucharist they call the Holy Offering. 
Of course, there is the, the loaf and then the, the wine, and they also speak of baptized faithful being able to receive the body and blood of Christ through the bread and wine, and they stress the real presence of Christ as understood in those elements. So as we continue with more information and further lectures, I imagine we'll, we'll even have more of that mention. Baptism is administered to infants of these Christian families, as we say that in quotes, new converts, but it's not going to be given to those, they say, for whatever reasons, enter into the church with uh, another baptism in a Trinitarian formula. So they will accept baptisms from others that have followed what they would regard as, as a correct formula. Then there's this anointing with oil, a triple immersion in consecrated water name of the Trinity, a sealing, a confirmation, and the imposition of hands there at the door of the altar. So they go through a lot of ceremony. The teachings there in the Church of the East is based, as they say, upon the faith of the universal church as set forth in the Nicene Creed. And then they speak of these mysteries, the mystery of the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Incarnation that is central to their teaching. They believe in the one triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believe in the teaching of the only begotten Son of God, the Word who became incarnate to bring salvation to man. And so as we conclude our thoughts here uh, with the uh, Nestorian aspect, I, I just have there, and you see in your notes before you, the Catholic Near East Welfare Association gives a pretty good summary statement. And uh, for time's sake, we won't continue on. Uh, you have that to see. But basically what this is saying is, they're trying to come about in um, uh, uniting in some ways, but then as the last part I have mentioned, there have been talks about unification, but as of today, that unification has not taken place. They uh, still see differences that they cannot work out at this time. And uh, so that's a little bit about the idea that we have of Nestorianism. Now let's go ahead and consider now our second topic of, of this part of our lecture, which is the Oriental Orthodox Church. Oriental is a way of saying in the East. And Orthodox is defined by Webster as conforming to the established doctrine, especially in religion. So in the East, those that are holding to the established doctrine. Now here we are again with a combination, though, of several groups that will call themselves the Oriental Orthodox Church. Six in particular... And they were listed on the slide Brother Warren gave. We'll go back through them. It's the Coptic Orthodox, the Iridian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, Malankara Orthodox, Syrian Church of India, and then the Armenian Apostolic Churches. Uh, they are in full communion with one another. They have similar uh, ideologies and doctrines, but they are autonomous of each other. They don't have what in the Eastern Orthodox you would think of their patriarch like at Constantinople. They don't have one like that who is set up over them. They don't have, as the Roman Catholics have, the Pope there in Rome. So there is an independence there, uh, but they have, because of that, established their own literatures and ritual, liturgy, and, and even with the different languages that are involved, they also have different versions of Scripture. Um, one of the sources I, I went to was a man named Taylor Marshall, and he said that, you know, in about four different areas here, you can sort of classify what we're talking about here in the Oriental Orthodox Church. And he gives some terms. He says Oriental Orthodox is used to distinguish them from the Eastern Orthodox. They don't want to be confused with them. Non-Chalcedonian. They did not accept the council at Chalcedon as the Roman Catholics and the, the Eastern Orthodox did. They also could be called Jacobites. Now, that's after Jacob... Uh, Baradeus, he was a, a Myophysite bishop in Edessa, and then that word uh, Myophysite, and they say that's honoring a term by Cyril, uh, Saint Cyril, as they see, uh, uh, meaning one nature. So again, as we try to look back over a little bit of the history, they say they can trace their heritage back to the first century and those missionary efforts there. The Oriental Orthodox, they will... Uh, look at a, a uniting with Rome and Byzantium and as far as a profession of faith up until the 5th century and then things changed as we said there with the Council of Chalcedon and they proclaimed Christ to have two distinct natures human and divine that's united in one person so the Council of Chalcedon if you remember was about 20 years after the Council of Ephesus 
saying that Jesus was uh, a single person, but he was existing in two complete natures, one human nature, one divine nature. Some agreed with that conclusion, and they were okay with that. Uh, others, though, opposed that decision. They saw, well, you're giving really a concession to a historian here. They, uh, they didn't agree with that, so you have these two lines of thought, and they're gradually just going to get further and further apart. So they're breaking off communion with one another. So what remains now is the ones that accepted the Council of Chalcedon and those who rejected it. And that was, as we're talking about now, the Oriental Orthodoxy. They call themselves the non-Chalcedonians. So they developed separate institutions, and uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches did not participate in any of the, the later ecumenical councils. So the Chalcedonians, now remember this is the opposing side, they began to look at these Oriental Orthodox Christians, started calling them monophysites. They're accusing them of following the teachings of Eutyches. He was mentioned a little earlier as well. Eutyches evidently insisted after the incarnation that these two natures of Christ, the human and divine, are going to be fused into one nature, the divine. And so this is going to result in denying the true humanity of Christ. Now this was condemned at Chalcedon along with Nestorianism, if you'll remember. So the Oriental Orthodox, as they hear this, that, that's being, uh, that they're being accused of, and, and they reject that description as monophysite, they say that's not accurate. And they officially condemned also the ideas of Nestorius and Eutyches. So they say we prefer to be known as the Maya Physite, M-I-A. And, and again, we're back to the idea of a single nature, saying, oh, Christ does have one nature, but this nature is both human and divine. So remember the council, again, of, of Chalcedon. Uh, the church is there in the east, decided no longer the church of the west. However, we're going to see there were influences that they still borrowed and brought over that impacted the East. So that's kind of some of the background and beginning stages of it. As far as these, these churches in the East and, and the expansion of them, um, they had a large percentage of adherents in countries such as Egypt, Libya, Sudan, Lebanon, and India. And even though these countries have the highest percentages, it continued spreading to various places, including the United States. Now, back here in our country, 2010, there was a census taken, and it says there were 227,000 here in our country that is adhering to this. Um, and I thought that I inserted this, thought it was interesting by Bowman. He said that these churches in the East never really tried to exclude or suppress various denominations and their belief systems in the, in the world around them, they didn't perceive other faith traditions as enemies. It says it's more like they kind of saw them as partners in this ongoing exploration of that which is sacred. So, so they weren't really dogmatic, evidently, toward others. They were allowing room for others to explore and find what they would. And again, today it's going to be hard to find accurate numbers but there were two sources listed that gave a range from 50 million to 70 million that are holding to these beliefs. That's quite a few, isn't it? So what about the Oriental Orthodox churches today? Since the 1960s, they would held conferences together trying to come to a reconciliation theologically with the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches. They said, we, we can work things out. Let's talk about how we can unify. And, and think about it for a moment. Imagine what, what that would be, what type of mass of people we're talking about now if they came to a total unification of these Oriental Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, and Roman Catholicism. We're talking massive numbers of people. So they felt like that they could do that. And connections were made between the Eastern Orthodox and the Oriental and this ecumenical movement. Uh, in January of 1994, Christianity Today carried an article that was titled Leaders Ending 1,500 Years of Official Schism. It says there were representatives from these Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, the Oriental uh, streams of orthodoxy who came together. They had a joint statement announcing procedures to come to a full restoration of communion. Well, that was in 94. Now they continue working toward that. By the time you get to 2014, 
there's this working group of the Joint Commissions of Dialogue. And they said again, they're seeing steps toward reconciliation between the Orthodox and the Oriental churches. But they also said there's still a lot of issues, a lot of things that they have to discuss further. But they said it's within our reach, though. They're saying we can do this. So talks of unification have continued. But as of today, uh, there, there is not a total unification between Eastern Orthodoxy and the Catholic Church and the Oriental Orthodox. It hadn't taken place to this point, but they are still continuing talks. Now, as far as these groups and, and how they're organized, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. They, um, again, back to the sources of, of those that have contributed toward this information. Collectively, they see themselves being, in their words, the one holy Catholic apostolic church that was founded by Jesus and his great commission. And they say that their bishops are successors of Christ's apostles. Now, they're going to be members of the World Council of Churches. They have a, a theology that they hold together, primarily the feature of myophysitism. They really are connected through that. These practices in communion, the rites that they observe, Armenian rite, West Syrian rite, and Alexandrian rite. Uh, and again, they say they maintain their own uh, apostolic succession. They're governed by holy synods. They have a bishop serves as primate, and he's going to hold a title as patriarch, catholicos, or pope. And among their patriarchs, the pope of Alexandria, he takes precedence. Some say he is the very face of Oriental Orthodoxy. He has governing powers, but he does not have them over the non-Coptic churches. And so they don't have, as I said, a, a magisterial leader like the Roman Catholic Church does. And they don't have one to um, bring together these special synods like the Eastern Orthodox does. So there are some differences there. And then as we bring our thoughts together now on their beliefs. Seven sacraments. They revere the mother of God and the saints. They have a valid, as they say, Eucharist. Pray for the faithful departed. Have preserved a valid line of the apostolic succession. And so I... Uh, added just some concluding thoughts there from the World Council of Churches from, from their website as they broke down each of these six and said if you wanted to get just kind of a very brief summary, just kind of putting together from, again, uh, from their words, the Coptic Orthodox says they can trace their history back to St. Mark the Evangelist. They say he founded the church in Egypt. These Copts are descendants of ancient Egyptians and they preserve that Coptic language. Uh, there was persecution since Byzantine times, but they said they held on very tightly to the faith of their fathers. They continued with the ascetic, the monastic traditions, and uh, that originated evidently in the Egyptian deserts, and so they also really stressed missionary uh, work in other parts of Africa. There's a dispersion of them, as we mentioned, North America, Europe, Australia, and the Middle East. Back to the, now the second, the Syrian Orthodox Church. They say they can trace their origin back to 37 A.D. and the traditions there of Peter. And uh, they suffered persecutions as well. There was a Hellenistic domination in the time of the Chalcedon. There was Mongol invasions. Uh, Turkish rule also created problems for them. Patriarchate had to be moved several times. And then finally it was set up in Damascus in the 20th century. Um, there was a decline after the 13th century, and uh, they vastly reduced their numbers because of Muslim denomination, and so there is in the U.S. and Australia and Europe quite a few. The Armenian Apostolic Church, they attribute their beginnings to, uh, again, St. Thaddeus and St. Bartholomew. In 301, I thought this was interesting, it said Armenia became the first nation to make Christianity its official religion, again, according to the sources themselves. Victims of terrible persecutions through the centuries, again, they were trying to hold on to the, the faith of their fathers, as they call it. Uh, there is uh, Catholicos of the Armenians resides in Armenia, but they also have a couple of other centers, uh, three other actually, in uh, Lebanon, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. So they're scattered throughout various continents as well. Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They say they can go back to the apostolic times as well. And uh, they spent time with the impression of the Coptic Orthodox Church, but then they pulled away from that and their autonomy in 1950. 
So they're governed by their own patriarch, the Addis Ababa. And so it says they use this ancient language of Giz, G-E-E-Z, I call that Giz, and modern Amharic in its, its liturgies. So they have these ancient languages that they use. So they think of their tradition and uh, that that they have brought forth from it. The Eritrean, I didn't see much information on them. They are autonomous as well and uh, had a direct relationship to the Coptic Orthodox Church, so evidently very closely tied with them. Their first patriarch was actually as late as 1998 with uh, Philippos I. And then, finally, the Malankara, the Indian Orthodox Church. And they said they cherish, uh, cherish the traditions of St. Thomas, of him being the founding father of Christianity there in India. Uh, they divide into Roman Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox families as the Western colonial missions uh, started emerging. And then they came in contact with the Syrian Patriarchate, Antioch, 1665. And so there was influences there because of this. They, uh, again, uh, declared their autonomy in 1912. They have colleges in uh, Katayam and Nagapur. They have a mission training center educational, charitable institutions. So they're fully involved in the life of their community. So they've really tried to not hold so much to the ancient ways as, as seeing the need they feel to spread out toward the community. 17 bishops and more than 1,000 parishes. And they're in North America, Malaysia, Singapore, and in other Gulf countries. So here in the last few minutes, I want to try as best I can to look at this and bring back some practical applications, some lessons for us. I know there's a lot of factual data, places and dates and things and what we've looked at, but I'm a practical person and I try to look at something and then come back and say, well, okay, but what does that mean for me? You know, knowledge is wonderful, but we need to be able to take that knowledge and say, what can I do with that? I think a few of the practical lessons we can see is just what happens when one begins to drift from God's Word. Uh, we certainly see a fulfillment of what Paul told Timothy, didn't we, as was mentioned earlier. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in those first three verses, when Paul says, Timothy, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving, and then which believe and know the truth. We see a fulfillment of this, don't we? It had already been progressing. We've noticed it in our, our previous lectures, but we continue to see it here as it just continues to expand. When we have additions to the written word, when we have traditions that are formulated, and they begin to be recognized as just as authoritative or perhaps even more so, then the Holy Scriptures, well, we know there's problems coming, don't we? We see that division occurs when one deviates from the standard, from the revealed Word of God. As long as that standard is followed, there will be unity, right? When there's no more and no less, when it's just God's Word. Isn't that what Jesus prayed about in John 17? Didn't He pray for the unity of all believers, that they would be one as you and I are one? Unity can be obtained if we take the Bible as the sole authority in spiritual matters. Then also there's a clear indication of what happens when New Testament Christians stop evangelizing. Remember when we backed way up as the beginning of this, some of it was not very far from the beginning of the church, was it? And it didn't take very long in some instances to see what starts to happen. And I believe that's what happens when we stop teaching the truth of God's Word, and, and we stop evangelizing. Error spreads, that leavening process, it increases. And so because of complacency, because of inactivity among us as God's children, there, there are some places where the church at one time was flourishing and thriving and growing, but now it no longer even has a presence there. It's been totally given over to denominationalism. I want to, in my closing, closing minute here, to share a little illustration with you. I know there are a lot of different versions of it, but I thought this would be kind of fitting to bring in right here, right now, as we're talking about what we must be doing today. It's about a young preaching student who was informed that he was going to have to deliver the sermon during chapel. Now, he had lived in mortal fear the entire time of being a student of that day coming, of having to preach 
in front of his peers and his professors, and he tried every way he could to get out of it. Uh, he, he told his professor, he said, look, give me extra assignments. I'll do whatever I need to do. Just please, please don't ask me to preach that sermon in chapel. I just cannot handle that. His professor said, but son, you've got to do it. It's part of the requirements. He said, you've got to do that to graduate. And tomorrow is your day to preach in chapel. Well, the next morning came. A young man, he was terrified. He walked up there in front of everyone. He got behind the podium, looked out over those in the chapel that day, and he said, brothers, do you know what I'm going to say? They all shook their heads, well, no. And he said, well, neither do I. Let's stand for the closing prayer. (laughs) Well, His professor, of course, was not very happy with that at all. He couldn't believe what this young man did. He went to him and he told him, he said, no. He said, it doesn't work that easily for you. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you another chance. Tomorrow, you will preach during chapel. Next day arrived. Back there in chapel, he stands up before everyone again. It's filled and he looks over them. And he starts off the same way he did the day before. He said, brothers, do you know what I'm going to say? Well, this time they already knew what happened when they said no, so this time they all were going to throw him off. They all nodded their heads yes. And so with a big sigh of relief, he said, well, since you already know what I'm going to say, there is no point in me saying it. Let's stand for the closing prayer. (laughs) Now, the professor is still not done with the young man. He said, no, that's it. He was really upset. He said, son, I'm going to give you one more chance. I mean, this is it. Tomorrow... You will preach during chapel. If you do not, you will not graduate. Next day, he starts off just like he did the first two days. He said, brothers, you know what I'm going to say? Well, all the students had already been kind of informed by the professors, and so wound up half of them nodded yes, and half of them shook their heads no. So the young man got a smile on his face. He said, Well, let those of you who know tell those who don't. (laughs) Let's stand for the closing prayer. Now think about that simple statement for just a minute. Isn't that what evangelism is? Let those who know tell those who don't. Isn't that it? We we take that word evangelism, it scares us to death. We feel like we have to be trained professionals. We feel like we have to go through all of these courses and books. No, we don't. Are you a Christian? Do you know how you became a Christian? Can you tell somebody else? Let those who know tell those who don't. And I I pray that God will help us to awaken to the fact that we have billions of souls in this world that's lost in error. I pray that he will awaken us to the fact that we have neighbors two doors down whose souls are in jeopardy. We have the truth, don't we? Let's share it with others. Thank you.